So I'm going to I'm going to talk about these things I call distributed oral exams, um, which is something that I've really started doing in its current form since um, since the pandemic started. Um, although it actually um, has antecedents that stretch back a lot further. Um, in particular, for, for many, many years, I've been doing kind of a conference style of grading um, where students actually come into my office and present their solutions to homework problems to me and we discuss them and spend maybe 15 minutes um, doing this at the end of which I, I give them a grade for, for that particular assignment. Um, once the pandemic started um, and we all went online last spring, um, there was of course a lot of, a lot of soul searching about how exams would work online. Um, and I think a widespread sense that they were kind of a problematic thing. Um, what with just how do you schedule them for students? Um, how do you deal with possible technology problems? How do you control the possibility that students might not be completely honest in them? Um, and while we're on the subject of exams, anyhow, I think there's a sort of stronger and stronger sense that sort of high stakes exams are, are not really a, a good thing if they can be avoided. Um, and so all of these um, influences kind of converged for me last March um, and, and led me to create these so-called distributed oral exams. Um, and so the way those work, is um, I, I will give students homework assignments um, in um, mostly I think because of the nature of my discipline, those tend to be sort of more or less weekly problem sets. Um, and then so after some period of time when the students have had a chance to work on the problem set, um, they still come, come and get together with me um, individually. Um, it used to be um, that, um, in some classes, at least if students were working in groups, I'd allow a small group of students to come and, and present their work collectively. Um, the exam word and distributed oral exam implies that this is now serving more of a, a sort of student assessment purpose. And because of that, um, I'm now, I now ask the students to come in individually. Um, but they still present their solution to me. We discuss it. Um, they can ask me questions if there were points in it that they were unclear on. I can um, ask them questions if there's part of their presentation that, um, that I want to know more about. Um, and the thing that makes this um, sort of serve as, as a kind of a mini exam um, is that part of what I will be asking them about is questions that are sort of variations on stuff that they have had a chance to prepare. Um, and so, you know, it'll, it'll be things like um, if, if this equation had x squared in it instead of x, um, how would that change what you did? Um, so so it's, it's small variations, but the important thing is it's things that the students haven't had a chance to prepare in advance. And so presumably um, really require the student to understand the sort of the thinking that goes into whatever answer they came up with. Um, Typically, I, I spend maybe 20 or, or 30 minutes on one of these meetings. Um, last spring, I was doing them 30 minutes. That was pretty comfortable. This semester, um, I've got a few more students. Um, I'm doing them, at, um, doing them at 20 minutes apiece. Um, that works. I feel it's a, the timing is a little bit tight, um, particularly if there's a student who, who is struggling to understand things and I want to spend a little bit of time um, trying to sort of help them. Um, but that's, that's the basic, uh, sort of the basic nature of these meetings. Um, and then of course the process repeats. Um, as I said, I, I do typically maybe 10 or 12 of these assignments in a semester. Um, so roughly one a week, a little bit less often. Um, and um, that, that is, that is um, this semester and sort of the end of last semester um, this has completely replaced traditional exams. Um, so I don't give hour exams, don't give midterms, don't give a final. Um, and maybe a, a little bit to my surprise, um, al although I had a lot of experience with, um, with, with the um, individualized or small group problem set grading in the past, um, 
I very much think that I have a much better sense of how well students understand material doing this than I would from working with a paper exam. Um, in particular, um, I think because I have a chance to have a conversation with the students, um, I'm able to kind of um, tell those students who understand the material but somehow aren't really able to articulate it. Um, or, and conversely, I think sort of recognize those students who have um, sort of polished answers, but perhaps their answers that they got some help from a tutor or a friend or the internet on and don't really understand what's going on behind it. Um, I, I think that this is lower stress for the students than traditional testing. Um, it's certainly not completely stress free. Um, for some students, the, you know, sort of having to meet with the professor and talk about their work is, is stressful. Um, although um, I, I think I'm able to kind of de-stress some of that after the first couple of meetings, they get to, they get, they get to see that I'm, I'm, I'm not going to bite their head off. I'm not trying to hold this meeting to, to trip them up or, or hurt them somehow. Um, and and, and I, I have had students um, who, who get halfway through a semester um, and don't even realize that they've been being tested um, while, while we're doing this also. Um, so so I, I think it is, um, I think it reduces a lot of the high stakes testing stress that students experience. Um, for, um, you know, I, I, I think the, um, the workload that this entails um, may, may seem insane. Sometimes I wonder um, if, if, um, if, if I'm really sane in um, the amount of time that I put into this. Um, but on the other hand, um, for, for me at least, um, I, I really like the fact that I'm not doing sort of, I, I'm not sitting around with stacks of essays or stacks of homeworks to grade. Um, I love that I don't have big stacks of exams that I have to, to have to grade. Um, so, so there are definitely um, payoffs for, for the time that I put into this. Um, and I do think that if people were interested in adopting the idea and kind of a, um, with kind of a lower level of commitment to it or something, um, that you, it is something that you could do fewer times per semester. You don't have to do it on every single um, assignment that you give the students. Um, I could conceive of, of a situation in which you, um, you, you do these, these sorts of one-on-one -on -one meetings with just a subset of the students each time and kind of cycle through the class or something. Um, it, prob you know, it probably wouldn't work if you had 150 students in your class. Um, but um, in, in the places where, you know, in the places where you can make it manageable, um, I, I've, I've, I've started to feel that this is a far better alternative than the, the traditional one or two or three large paper exams every semester. Um, and I believe at least that it works better for the students. Um, and so I simply wanted to kind of share that experience and maybe get some, get any feedback or suggestions or thoughts that you folks have. Um, and that is pretty much what I have to say. So thank you. <laughs> I don't have exams anymore, period. You know, they'll have an essay to write or whatever. So I love the format. Even Matt can be a little bit more humane uh, about evaluation, you know, take some of the pressure out. Uh, and my question is not, you know, to be oppositional, but Senate just passed new measures for students to challenge, you know, grades. And I'm trying to figure out what kind of record do you keep of this exchange? Are students aware of whatever grade you wrote on your magic book? Uh, because it seems that, you know, uh, the, the process of challenging grades is a little bit more complicated. I, I think students should be empowered, you know, to challenge grades whenever they feel they've been wrong. But how do you keep track of this madness of time? <laughs> I, am, <laughs> I applaud the idea. I am also math phobic. Yeah. Um, well, well I, th I think there are two parts to that. Um, the, the, the one thing that I am probably weak on is um, keeping a, a sort of formal record of what the students have turned in um, and um, sort, of, sort of what my judgment on it was. Um, on the other hand, um, I think one of, the, one of the benefits of doing the one-on-one -on -one meetings 
is at the end of that meeting, I give the student their grade. Okay. Um, so, so, so they walk out of the room knowing that you got, they got four out of five points on, on, on this assignment or whatever. Um, there, there is a rubric. Um, so I do publish as part of the syllabus, the rubric that I use for, for grading these things. Um, and I, I find that, that in, the, in most cases, particularly if I have to give the student a low grade, um, by the end of the meeting, they, they understand why I'm giving that grade and, and seem to agree that it's the grade they deserved. Um, so I, I think there's much less challenging of grades that happens in this kind of system than there would be in one that had less of that kind of personal touch to it. So. Good, good, good answer. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Doug, and that was, that was my question was, was about the rubric, you know, whether you, whether you actually had a rubric and how you go about coming up with the, the actual grade. Yeah, no, I do have a rubric. It's, um, as you might imagine, it's a, it's a fairly general rubric because um, it is something that I try to put in a syllabus, try to make it concise, um, but will serve throughout the whole semester. Um, and it, um, it, it tends, well, I mean, the sort of the, the general feel of the rubric is you get, you get about half credit if you give, if you can give correct responses to most of the questions, but cannot give correct explanations of why those are the right answers or how you got them. Um, you get uh, you get three quarters credit um, if you can generally give correct explanations of how you are, are approaching the problems, but maybe can't actually sort of operationalize those. So you know you have in my case again you have algebra errors or things like that in your answers, um, even though you can express what you should be doing. Um, so those it, th those are sort of, that's kind of the level at which the rubric is written. Doug, um, forgive me if you already spoke to this, but do you do you find that taking this approach um, enables you to stage the process of their learning and scaffold their learning better than if there are sort of uh, in a more traditional approach, maybe there are longer intervals um, between the time students are taught something and the time you get feedback on how well they're learning it and they get feedback on how well they're learning right. it. This seems like this cycle seems to give them and part of what undoubtedly makes it crazy for you. <laughs> it, it gives them a steady stream of feedback and is giving you a steady stream of feedback. You, you've mentioned that you have yeah. a clearer sense of of how they're learning. Um, but But thinking about it from the the student's point of view, is it your sense that they, it sort of incrementalizes their learning more effectively than a traditional approach and, and, and they make progress more effectively? Um, well, I, I, I think that's part of the, just sort of the face-to-face -face meetings and kind of the fast turnarounds generally. Um, the, the, just the sort of oral exams part of it implies using this for a more sort of a major part of the students of my assessment of the students. Um, I don't know that that in and of itself um, contributes, but, but yes, absolutely. The, the fact that I am meeting with the students and in a 15 or 20 or 30 minute period, um, uh, they are showing me their work and I'm giving them my feedback on it um, that I, and, and that I'm doing this roughly weekly. Um, yes, that absolutely makes a big difference, I think, in terms of how effective the feedback that they're getting is and how, you know, how well in touch I am with their learning, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I can't help wondering how, um, Maria and Lytton and I and others um, in, the, in this meeting who teach students writing, um, how we might use an approach like this um, in part to overcome one of the big problems in teaching writing, which is that you, know, you, you assign a paper and a student, a student turns in a paper and, and there are many different things about it that you typically 
are great and you may have a rather complex rubric and, and, you, know, and, you, and you give them a grade on the assignment that is based on a whole bunch of different things you have expected them to do simultaneously. And if you could, if, if, if we, when we're teaching writing, could figure out how to break some of those things down and give the kind of assignment you're giving, have them come to us with a smaller chunk of work. And this is different from, I mean, I, I have students write drafts a lot. I'm sure we right. all do, right? But each time they give you a draft, you're looking at a whole bunch of different things about that draft and giving them feedback. And the, the interesting question is, could we focus narrowly in each assignment on one much smaller thing, have the same kind of conversation and feedback loop that you're describing and, and find that, um, I don't know if you've had any discussion with Jillian um, or you know about the applicability of this to INTD 105, but it just seems like it's it's got a ton of potential beyond the the assignment type that you are using yourself. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm no, going to give Doug. Um, I'm just going to give Doug 30 seconds on that one, and then we're going to have to move on to Joe <laughs> Dolls. But it sounds like this is a, a next conversation for next semester. Yeah. Um, so, so I do indeed do this with INTD 105 students, um, and some of the um, and and it, it's it's tied to draft and revision <laughs> cycles. Um, some of the best conversations that I've had um, have have been when I've sat down with an INTD 105 student, um, and, and we've really gotten into sort of a long discussion of what the thesis they're trying to to argue for is, and and um, how, how could they make that a tighter thesis or what more does their argument need? Um, so so I, th I think there are great things you can do there. 